So I'm Bruce Landsberg. I'm the vice chair of the National Transportation Safety Board. And uh, we're here to talk about uh, flight data monitoring. And that would sound like a pretty arcane subject, but it gets us to a really critical uh, aspect of how you implement a safety management system, and more importantly, how to keep from having a bad uh, outcome. So let's get the next slide here. There we go. So this is what we're gonna be talking about. And um, can anybody here identify for me, define what flight data monitoring actually is? I mean, we talk about it, things a lot. Anybody out there want to take a stab at it? Silence is deafening. Okay, I will ask my uh, august panel here, which we will uh, introduce shortly. Would anybody like to try to identify what flight data monitoring actually is? I'll jump in. Um, Morgan. You know, I think it's, it's objective data used in the pursuit of continuous improvement really boiled down to the, the simplest level. You were listening yesterday. Spontaneity is best when carefully planned. Boeing identifies flight data monitoring as objective analysis of aircraft and operational systems that provide actionable data for continuous improvement. Hold that thought because that's going to flow throughout uh, everything uh, that we do. So this is what we're going to be covering. Next slide, please. Panel will uh, do introductions. So uh, Tom, start with you. My name is Tom Lupersbeck. I'm from FAA headquarters. I'm the manager of the air carrier training and flight simulation training uh, device policy section. And my, uh, that's a temporary, I'm acting there, and my full-time gig is in the uh, Part 135 Air Carrier Operations Policy Branch at Washington. Thank you. Reed Nelson, we're uh, in Houston, Texas. We're a Cirrus Aircraft Partner and Service Center, Training Center, and, and small 135 operator. We've got 16 aircraft in the fleet that uh, we have a FOCA program on all 16 airplanes. Excellent, Reed. Morgan. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Morgan Bondi. I fly for Adobe out of San Jose. We're a Part 91 Business Aviation Department operating one G650 and uh, proud to be a, a flight data monitoring supporter. Great. Excellent. Hey, good morning. My name is Jason Greenleaf, the Director of Safety with uh, Jetit. We're a fractional and uh, 135 91K company flying primarily Honda jets, but also some couple Gulf Streams and uh, transition to the Phenoms as well. So we currently have 24 aircraft under certificate and then continuing to grow. Okay. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Jens Senny with the General Aviation Manufacturers Association. I work uh, safety, security, and operations. Good morning. My name is Frank Raymond with the Air Charter Safety Foundation. I'm the director of safety there, and uh, we head up our ASAP programs and our newly launched FDM program. And on the end, good morning. Doug Carr with NBAA. If you were here for the last session, you got to know me a little bit. Uh, the great team we have at NBAA helps to tackle a whole host of safety and security and operational issues. Mark Larson in the back is a significant part of the safety effort for us. Welcome. Thank you. This thing is just not working. Next slide, please. So this is what we're gonna be talking about. And one of the things that's on our most wanted list is the fact that we'd like to see crash resistant recorders because when we get to the site, usually things may not be in pristine condition. It's gonna be burned, smashed, or sunk. And so if the recorder doesn't survive or the monitor, uh, that's a bit problematic. Now, what we're talking about here though is not going to be the TSO kind of equipment that will sit for uh, two years underneath the water uh, as we've seen in a number of, of previous crashes. And there's two reasons for having flight data monitoring. One is that it makes our job tremendously easier, but that's very self-serving. The main reason for doing it is to use it for prevention. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk about a small operator, and actually, Morgan, I'm smaller than you are because I'm not flying a, a Gulfstream. I'm flying a Bonanza as a single engine pilot. Now, Mark Twain famously said, put all your eggs in one basket and then watch that basket. Well, for me, my basket is the engine. So it's really important that I take good care of the engine. Next slide, please. 
So I have an engine uh, data monitoring system, and for any flight, it's putting out literally thousands of data points, and it's telling me what's going on right now. But that information isn't particularly valuable unless I'm analyzing it and being able to predict what's going to go on wrong with that engine maybe 10, 20 hours out in advance. So I have a subscription service that I work with, and every couple months I download my information, and it takes a look. Next slide, please. When I change my oil, next slide, please. Yeah, when I change the oil, I always get uh, an oil analysis. So once again, I can monitor the baseline. Just as you take your blood pressure, hopefully periodically, and you get a baseline, you can start to see when things are starting to get out of hand. And we get a report card back and says, OK, everything is good, or you've got some caution areas that you need to think about. This boils it down to the most basic level. It's not very expensive. We'll talk about cost here in, in just a little bit. But that's, uh, that's basically it. Next slide, please. So we're going to start off by showing uh, how if you don't follow up with uh, President Reagan once upon a time said, trust but verify. What we need to do is to uh, look at the data that our people are collecting. And when things don't work right, then we have a uh, problem. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Chris Babcock from NTSB to come up and to narrate a couple of the challenges that we've had along the way. Chris? Morning, everybody. Am I, uh, can I, everybody hear me? Yes. Great. Um, next slide, please. So um, good morning. My name is Chris Babcock. I'm a branch chief in the Flight Recorder Lab at the NTSB. Uh, this morning, myself and uh, my colleague Dave Lawrence, hiding behind the poster over here, uh, we're going to highlight a, a few accidents um, that we both have worked on over the past several years where we feel that uh, had the operators and owners had a flight data monitoring program, um, they would have had a lot more insight into the particular risks that were involved in their flight operations. Uh, next slide, please. We're going to try to be brief. Um, we're going to give all the opportunity we can to our distinguished panel here to discuss how their programs are working in the real world. Um, but we have some printed material in the back of the room in case anybody wants to go a little deeper into these cases. Uh, the first case we're going to talk about today is the Gulfstream G4 accident in Bedford, Massachusetts back in May of 2014. Next slide. Now, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people in this room are familiar with this accident. It involved a single aircraft Part 91 owner operator. Now, this airplane was equipped with a quick access recorder, or QAR, which was designed specifically to facilitate a flight data monitoring program. However, the owner operator in this case did not have a program and was not able to, to gain any insight from that data recorded. Now, after the accident, we accessed that data. We had data from the previous 175 departures. We found that in 98% of those departures, there was no complete flight control check done before takeoff. So as a result, um, the flight crew attempted to take off with the flight control gust lock engaged. They were unable to rotate the airplane. It crashed at the end of the runway, and seven people were killed. Uh, next slide, please. Now, after this accident, we made a recommendation to MBAA. Uh, we asked them to... Um, coordinate and publicize a study that used existing corporate FDM data uh, that was already out there across a variety of aircraft types. Uh, in my opinion, the study uh, they did an excellent job with. Uh, they looked at over 140,000 departures over a variety of types, and they found that in almost 18% of cases, uh, there was no complete flight control check prior to takeoff. And I think that raised a lot of eyebrows in the industry, and they made uh, several recommendations to, uh, to try to improve those numbers. Uh, if you haven't read that study, it's available on the internet. I highly encourage you to, uh, uh, to take a look at it. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Captain Lawrence now to talk about a, a couple other cases. Good morning, everybody. Uh, David Lawrence. I'm a National Resource Specialist and a Senior Investigator at the NTSB. The next two uh, accidents are two that I worked on. A lot of you guys are familiar with this uh, particular accident back in 2015. It's an Executive Flight Hawker 700 Alpha that uh, crashed on approach in Akron, Ohio. Now, this uh, particular operator was a Part 135 operator. It was on an on-demand flight, so it was a 135 flight. It did have a CVR, but there was no flight data monitor, no flight data recorder, and most of the performance data that we got out of the uh, airplane track was actually um, originated out of uh, 
air traffic control radar data. That was the best that we could do on this particular uh, flight. Um, it was an unstable approach. The airplane almost, uh, the first officer was fine and it almost stalled right before the uh, final approach fix. Uh, they were misconfigured with full flaps and descended at a great rate down to the minimum descent altitude and continued below the MDA and never had the airport in sight. And by the time they realized they were below the MDA and brought the power up, they did not, or decided to arrest the descent, they never brought the power up and the aircraft stalled on approach. Um, there were multiple deviations from standard operating procedures. As I said, the first officer was flying. He was not supposed to be flying at the time. Uh, he was not authorized to fly by the company standards, and uh, the approach briefing was never completed. There were multiple checklists that were completed, and of course they uh, deviated from federal regulations as far as the MDA is concerned. Uh, like every accident for a certificated operator or a Part 91 business operator that I investigate, I ask the same question every time from the operator. How do you know your pilot's are doing the right thing and following SOPs and standard operating procedures when you give them the keys to the jet and you let them go? And the answer always is we don't. There's a trust. And in this case, the operator had no idea that this crew was not following SOPs on a regular basis. The recommendations that came out of this one was actually the genesis of 135 FDM and SMS recommendations that the NTSB um, has put out. Uh, we asked for uh, SMS and flight data monitoring, and not just the flight data monitor itself, but the program to used to analyze that data as well. And um, we also uh, asked the FAA to start looking at some of the other 135 operators and use your uh, safety assurance system to try and find other operators out there that may not be following SOPs on a regular basis. The next one I'm sure all of you are familiar with as well is back in 2017 happened after the Akron. This was a Trans-Pacific Lear 35 that crashed on approach going into Teterboro, uh, New Jersey. It, again, was a Part 135 operator. However, this particular flight was a Part 91 repositioning flight um, that crashed on approach in Teterboro. It did have a CVR that told us a lot of information, but again, this particular aircraft did not have an FDR. It did not have a flight data monitor, and the, the uh, operator did not have a flight data monitoring program. Uh, this was an unstable approach uh, as it come, came in on a circle to land to Teterboro. Uh, if you have not read a transcript of any of our accident reports, you don't have to read the whole report, but if you, if you haven't done it, this is the transcript that you probably want to read from one of our reports. Because the, the lack of professionalism, the lack of standardization, and the lack of CRM was staggering on this particular flight. So um, again, I asked this operator, how do you know your pilots are doing the right thing when you give them the keys and they go out and they start flying passengers around. And the answer was, we don't, because they don't have a flight man data monitor and they don't have a program as well. Next slide, there. Out of this, since there was so much similarity between the Teterboro accident and the Akron accident, we ended up uh, reiterating both the um, the, FM, uh, the FDR, the, uh, I'm sorry, the FDM and program recommendations and also safety management, SMS recommendation for part 135. We also uh, made a recommendation to the operator and the FAA to have some type of program when you have pilots that in this case had serious deficiencies in their training in the background. How do you let them out there and how do you monitor their progress as they go back out on the line after their, those deficiencies? And uh, like I said, we did a lot of reiterations of uh, recommendations that came out of the Akron accident itself. And those were uh, just some of the case studies that we used for the flight data monitoring. I'll give it back to you. Okay. Thank you uh, very much, Dave and, and Chris. So the saying is nobody's ever completely worthless. They can always serve as a bad example. <laughs> The situation that you just saw, in several cases, these operators had had a pretty good flight record for the preceding years. They're doing a lot of flights, hundreds, thousands of flights. It's the next one that's important, and if you're not working at that, you're not taking full advantage. 
So there is objection to this. You've already heard people say, well, it's too much problem, it's going to be a lot of trouble, etc. Well, sometimes when the government gets involved, that is certainly true. Uh, given my current source of paycheck, I won't elaborate on that any farther, but you can probably figure it out. So we now want to talk about uh, the elephants in the room uh, and some of the impediments to adoption. And some of them are going to involve privacy, cost, the equipment uh, that's needed, enforcement, regulation kinds of things, punitive action, nobody likes Big Brother, and uh, finally just a general confusion about it works. And we have a, gr a group of experts here who uh, have actually done this and understand how it all works. But first I want to turn to Tom because this may be one of the big things here, and that is about FAA enforcement. And what data would you gather and how would you use it, say, after an incident or an accident? Well, you know, when investigating an accident or an incident, we are going to look at all the available information. I mean, that, that's what we do. And, and quite often we, we work with our, our friends at the NTSB if they can't show up for an accident. You know, we, we work closely with them. But that's why we've established certain programs. And we have to have a way of saying, you know, if you give us this information, here's what we'll, we'll do with it. It's kind of like if we have to come get the information, it's going to be a little bit different. But, but the operators generally, when something happens, they have an incident or an accident, they're as actively engaged as finding out, in finding out what happened as us at the FAA or our friends at the NTSB. So that's why we've established programs like Flight Operations Quality Assurance. Uh, Morgan and I were talking about that, that this morning, and, and you heard him mention it briefly. We also have programs like ASAP, the Aviation Safety Action Program, where the you operators look at what happened and the information you glean, when you share that with us, then there are certain, uh, for example, under FOQA, Flight Operations Quality Assurance, there's a regulatory assurance of privacy for you. And that enforcement action won't be taken based on the information that is voluntarily provided to us. And that, that's a statutory requirement that was incorporated into regulations. The same thing that applies to uh, FOQA applies to programs like ASAP, where there's no statutory requirement, but we've given assurances that we're not going to use that information against you. The statutory requirements also say that any information that we do share is, is going to be redacted and, and the privacy maintained. So. <clears throat> We, we often go back and forth, do we want to mandate this or that? You know, SMS, FOQA, ASAP programs, voluntary things. We had a discussion, what was it, you and I this morning, Morgan, were talking about, you know, if you make somebody do something, quite often they have a dusty book or a manual on their shelf, they have no idea what's in it. What we're trying to do is, is I hate to use the word sell or convince people that this is a good thing to do. If you monitor your operations, the first thing people say is it'll save money. From the FAA perspective, that's not our goal. Our goal is to save lives and to keep people safe. But you can accomplish that the same way, and that's why we give the incentive, incentives to voluntarily participating in programs like FOQA and ASAP so that people will see the, the, the net benefit of doing these programs. Well, let's suppose somebody isn't a part of FOQA or ASAP and they have a, as our, our traffic friends refer to it, a deal, okay? What happens then? So many of you may, may remember uh, several years ago, we, we came up with this thing called the compliance philosophy because it used to be you violate a rule, we're going to initiate an enforcement action against you. It's either going to come down to a, you know, a, a suspension, a revocation, a monetary fine. And, and I hate to say we, we woke up, but we realize that the majority of the people out there operating aircraft in, in, in the NAS are, are willing or, or they're not intentionally violating the rules. And doing down, going down the enforcement path is not what we want to see. You know, we, we don't get that money. <laughs> what we really want to see is people back operating in compliance with the regulations. They're there to ensure safety in operations. So now the philosophy went to an actual policy. You can find that in our guidance, where the first thing that 
should be looked at by any inspector out there in the field is whether or not the operator, A, unintentionally violated those rules, and if B, if they want to come back into compliance. Of course, I, I will say that you know intentional and criminal acts, they're off the table. You don't get immunity for those. But that's where we've shifted our focus in just bringing people and helping people come back into compliance with the rules. And sometimes they may have a, pro a process or a procedure or an SOP or something that maybe is missing a piece that we can try to help them with. Just briefly about how ASRS fits into this situation. So the Aviation Safety Reporting System, uh, which has been around for a long, long time, um, the sole purpose of that is, is for us, and I mean us, everybody, to have information surrounding events. A lot there is some there are some misnomers surrounding that that it's a get out of jail free card, and and it's really not a get out of jail free card. It's just a, a card that pretty much says we we won't take action against you. In other words, you might still end up with a violation. You just won't suffer a suspension or a penalty. So that's certainly step one that you, you everybody we we need that information. Everybody needs that. When you read for those of you that get that. Uh, there's a lot of information in there, and we want it, and again, that's the incentive for that. No penalty. So, Reed, for you, um, you've got a, a small operation by some people's uh, description. Not as small as Morgan or mine, but uh, anyway, how do you deal with your pilots when something looks like it's outside of parameters, and how do you address that? because a lot of people say, oh geez, you know, I'm gonna get in trouble. And, and if they're monitoring the airplane and doing everything, uh, this could be bad. So <clears throat> we, have a, we have a weekly pilot safety meeting every Monday morning. We bring the pilots in either in person or in Zoom. And a lot of the, the um, exceedances, let's say, could be, could be generalized in, in conversation. Uh, for example, we might say that, uh, you know, we noticed uh, high CHTs, or we're dealing with piston aircraft, high CHTs in the climb, we talked to maintenance, and, and uh, we believe that uh, um, the pilots need to, to be aware of their fuel flow during the climb out. And, uh, and just in general, just having a general discussion about, hey, let's watch our fuel flows in the climb, and somebody might, or one of the instructors typically will raise their hand and say, well, that was my flight. And, it, and it's, it, we've kind of built a little camaraderie with the group so that uh, the, the pilots are willing to sort of tattle on themselves. And, uh, and it generates really good discussion then because then we can discuss. So everybody, know, can, everybody, everybody can learn, everybody can learn from it, absolutely, yeah. So that's kind of a general, you make more of a generalized approach to it, I think, initially. If, if it's something more egregious, then, then you know, we have a, a private um, discussion with with the pilot you know, we've got renters we've got aircraft owners so it's not just our professional pilots but um, some of those discussions with with uh, say a pilot owner who might have just a little more ego uh, can can be uh, interesting and we have to handle it delicately for sure sure um, if I may add on. please uh, I think I think Reed touched on on some great things there regarding you know, the pilots being the ones that want to come forward and talk about their events. And, and when I think about flight data monitoring, I think about the, the events and then the trends. And I think the trends are what should be coming from the safety program. They should be, you know, your gatekeeper, your safety manager should be the one coming back to the pilot group with trends that they're seeing. But if, if you can create the culture where when events happen, the pilots are the ones coming to the safety program and saying, hey, can I, can I get the data? I think we just had an approach that didn't go the way we wanted it to. And then they're the one that gets to tell their story back to the pilot group, back to the organization. And with small operations, it, anonymity is really difficult. Uh, if, if we have an operation in, a, in a one airport in one year and we happen to have an event there, if we want to try to remain anonymous with that event, we have to de-identify the data so much that, it, that we lose value in that data. So having the culture where the pilots are the ones that want to tell their stories like, hey, at the next pilot meeting or safety day, can I talk about this event? Uh, I think that's a, a real way to, to supercharge that, that flight data monitoring program. Okay. Jason, how about you? Very similar as that. Our initial approach is we don't, as we advertised it and started building the culture before we even brought on our devices, you need to prepare your, your pilot groups and let them know what the point and the purpose of FDM is, right? Demystify it for people who have never dealt with that before. And so, you know, our initial approach going in there is, hey, we're not looking at individual flights. You know, for our flight department with you know, 24 aircraft flying 50 plus flights a day. I, 
as a single safety manager, I don't have time to go look at every single flight. So just by nature, we're looking at data in the aggregate. And just like Morgan and everyone else has talked about, we're looking for trends. You know, if we have those initial exceedances, you know, we're going to handle that similar to we have an ASAP program. We'll all discuss those in more of a confidentiality or anything else with that individual and figure out what happened. You know, encourage them to file that, perhaps they filed an ASAP to go along with that event already so we know the, not only what happened but why. And now we're going to discuss the trends or the lessons learned amongst the group without really identifying that single person that set, that, set off that event. Do any of you have any kind of incentive to help pilots to feel better about turning state's evidence, if you will, and say, hey, you know, now for me, I've been flying a long time. You don't get to look like this unless you've done this for quite a while. And um, I'm still looking for that perfect flight. So I'm, I'm just curious as to how do you get people to open up? I think it starts early with, again, you know, cultures, you know, maybe thrown out there that just culture, but, you know, we've started even before we had our FDM of, of highlighting at events that, you know, through safety investigations, and everything else, and talking about it during our during our pilot forums. Expand on that a little bit about how you kind of prepared the ground before you dug the hole. Right. I mean, it's talking to them about what we're looking for, and then really setting up the parameters before the meetings of of explaining. Here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about an incident that happened, and it's not just an anonymous, you know. You know, of course, the Lyra at Teterboro, we could talk about that. But it really drives the point home more if we can find something that happened within our pilot group. And we, you know, talked to the, the flight crew that was involved ahead of time and said, hey, we plan to talk about this. You know, invite you to talk about your lessons learned. But then, you know, collectively as a group, we've been doing this now for a while where every, every flight crew meeting, they know we're going to talk about an incident or something that's happened amongst the group, you know, amongst us. And as we're in that group, you know, that, that circle of trust amongst all the flight crew themselves. I mean, it really generates a discussion where, you know, I may kick off the topic of discussion and kind of guide it, but really the flight crew themselves have now been leading through and, and pulling out those lessons learned and asking each other questions and, you know, we're refining our SOPs and everything else. It just kind of builds upon itself. Okay. For our two associations down at the end, you're uh, running programs now, and you're aggregating a tremendous amount of information from individual operators as well as from groups. Can you tell us a little bit about how you do that? So we're just starting. We, we launched our program uh, at the beginning of the week. Uh, we've had a couple of beta test operators that have been working with us uh, for the last, what, 9, 12 months now. Um, so we don't have a lot of data to aggregate. Um, but we are reaching that point where we're able to start doing benchmarking. Um, so we're able to start saying, you know, your, your rate in this parameter is X, the group rate is Y, uh, you're, you're better or worse. Uh, and if you're better, why? Is there something that we can learn from that to, to share with our other operators? And if you're not quite as good, why? Maybe there's some opportunity to, to improve that. So for us, you know, just starting our program, you know, that's where we're, that's where we're wanting to go, uh, is to be able to, to aggregate that and share that with our members um, so that we can learn from each other. We can get better as a group, not as just a single operator. Doug, anything to add? I think from our perspective, the, uh, the, the objective of not recreating the wheel was, was important. And so I think there are a number of really great data collection programs that are out there. Uh, the one that we spend most of our time interfacing with is hopefully one you all have heard about called ASIAS, uh, the Aviation Safety Information and Analysis Sharing System managed by the FAA, of which there continues to be a growing contingent of business aviation operators supplying data into it, not just directly, but through other programs such as, such as Baldwin, such as I think perhaps even ACSF uh, and others that are out there, the Gulfstream program, they're all they're all sharing some component of that information with ASIAS. And for us, it's about making sure that program, the ASIAS program, is valuable for our community. Is it measuring data points that can help you benchmark yourself in the kind of aircraft that you operate going to the airports that you use? I think we're seeing some pretty good success there. We're seeing the data help us identify the kind of focus areas that we believe are important. And for, for me, it really is about finding ways to encourage our community to, 
to share that data beyond, beyond the individual relationship you have with your analytics team to the greater community so that we all have an, an ability to learn and improve. Yeah? Yeah, building on uh, Doug's comment on the ASIAS program and going back to the impediments, uh, I think we're right now north of about 150 operators on the airplane side in the ASIAS program on the turbine side. Uh, we also have a team here in the, in the room from the FA that's supporting the development of similar one for rotorcraft. And even more exciting to just get pilots into the right culture. We also have a component for the university programs. So just last week out in Colorado as part of the UAA conference, we hosted uh, a component of that, an InfoShare session. And these are the flight schools, the large universities that as part of training their pilots to fly the next generation, the people that you're hiring, Starting out day one, they're already part of a safety program that looks very much like what they'll experience in business aviation or in the airlines. So when you arrive at the operator, the cultural issue that we were struggling with 10, 15, 20 years ago, can I trust the safety program? Since this has been there from day one with the new pilots, I see that kind of starting to dissipate. I think we can even in a successful scenario, Yep. No questions asked, and it, it's just how we do things. Yeah, and, and I, it, you know, if we're really successful with those programs, and you know, all the big universities are there, many of the other flight schools, I can see a scenario where if you're hiring a pilot and you don't have that safety program, they might put a question mark around why you're not doing that as an operator today. Sure, sure. Okay, so we've been dealing with small elephants, miniature ones. Let's talk about a big one, liability, one word. So I throw it out to the group. Um, uh, let's just say that the uh, legal system is very uh, creative and, and enthusiastic about what they do. And people sometimes say, well, what's the difference between NTSB when you are assessing probable cause versus you know, uh, the legal system? Our job is focused on safety. The legal system is usually, uh, shall we say, redress of grievances and, dare I say, money. Our focus is different. But when you have a situation and you've got a lot of data, there's going to be naturally a desire to recover some of that. And of course, here we are trying to collect it for the purposes of safety, not a redress of grievance. So I open it up. Uh, whoever wants to take the first shot. <laughs> it's, it's sort of like a, a large company with a, you know, with a data retention policy with all of their emails. Um, I, I look at it, I think if an operator is just collecting data um, and archiving it and not really doing anything with it, then, then that could be problematic. Maybe you need to take a look at having some sort of a data retention policy. Um, but if you're actively an, uh, analyzing the data objectively and, and building, building out safety programs um, and changing the way you're operating based on the data, I, I think that's a, a, a far greater good than, than you know, the uh, uh, liability of having the data on hand. At the end of the day, the data, the flight data recorders in the airplane, everybody's going to have the data anyways in the event of an accident. Uh, I would rather have the data and have analyzed it and, and have it immediately. Um, so I think that, yeah. I think very, very similar in terms of for the better good. It, it, I think that oftentimes in these discussions we get, we start looking at, you know, what's the cost of doing this? What's the, the liability around the data that we have? And I think the counter argument to that is, what's the liability if we don't? And, and trying to develop that, that approach, whether it's with your, your corporation, what, the individuals that you work with, that, that by, by maintaining this data, by using the data in a positive way, we're, we're doing everything that we can as an organization to try to prevent that incident or accident that would actually cause all that data to become um, you know, potentially uh, discoverable. So I think it's that, it's that argument of what's the cost of not doing it. I think the reality is that if Bruce or Mike are coming to visit, something bad has happened. And at that point, what protection really should you expect? Because their job is to get to the bottom of figuring out what happened. So they're going to be looking through all of your records anyway. I mean, at that point, I think protection becomes the least of your concerns. Uh, so why not use all of that information that more and more aircraft are able to, to produce today, whether it's with something like this that you strap on your knee or coming right from the airplane. 
to prevent yourself from having a visit from Bruce or Mike in the first place. I wish you wouldn't put it so personally, but uh, <laughs> now, you know, you, you think about uh, how we approach these challenges and you heard Captain Lawrence say in all three of the cases that we investigated the crashes, nobody had done anything for collecting or aggregating data and that doesn't speak well to the organization. If you can say, hey, we were doing everything that we could, uh, that makes a difference. Now, when I came to NTSB, I learned a difference in vocabulary, and that was the difference between a crash and an accident, because I thought they were synonymous. They're not. An accident is something that's unforeseen and unpredictable. A crash is something where we know what happened, we know why it happened, and we absolutely know how to prevent it. In the three cases that we just cited, those were crashes. They weren't accidents. And so if you have a good data monitoring system and you're aggregating things and actively working on it first, we'll never have that conversation. We'll just get together on a social basis. However, if you do have a crash and you have been doing everything that's reasonably possible, I have to think that that's going to play in your favor. Jens? Yeah, going back to the uh, first accidents that uh, Chris Babcock briefed, the Bedford the event. Gulfstream. Yep, the Bedford one. I think that that event, it uh, very tragic, but also a lot of lessons learned. MBA's safety leadership on this one is impressive and just reinforcing Chris's discussion here. Read the report. Going back to the ASIAS program and other programs that were leveraged to develop that report, we went in and looked at how frequent is this as the industry? Was that just one operator or was it a systemic issue? So you're talking about flight control checks prior to departure. Yep. And the data was concerning. I think the number was about 17% of the operations in the aggregate data pointed to, hey, this is not being done correctly by the flight crews. Now, that's an interesting data point. But after the very active set of communications from everybody, the lessons learned from the NTSB, the work by NTSB safety committees, we're looking at the data and the data is moving in the right direction. And it's stayed at a much lower level now for the past several years. So not, it's a practical example about what we can do through an assize program for the, the work with, with GE, C Folkwell, or others that are out there, there's not a shortage of them out there, where you can both identify the issue, ideally before the accident, but then also include the safety controls to monitor it. One item that we're also trying to keep tabs on is how long does the safety education last? And data so far is mostly good. We're keeping an eye on it inside the protected data. There's an inkling that it might be moving slightly upward because it's been four or five years. We moved on to other issues. Uh, not to the point where we need to, to uh, set off alarm bells here, but we're keeping an eye on it. And the active operator is saying, huh, wrong trend line. So we can now have an opportunity before we have the next Bedford to put out the safety messages that were so successful four or five years ago and say, we know this is a risk, we know how to manage it, a lot of time is behind us, let's, let's double down on that safety effort to just keep staffing it. It's a practical look at how we look at the aggregate safety issues across that the That is a huge point because um, let's say memory is finite, mine is becoming ever more finite as I go along, but um, to the extent, I mean, particularly as you bring new people into your organization and as generations turn over. I think we saw it with uh, uh, EMS, where we, were, uh, we learned a generation ago of helicopter pilots, you don't tell the crew the nature of the, the mission that they're going to fly, whether it's a, a child that is certainly going to die if you don't launch, or if it's somebody that has a broken leg that you're, you're gonna fly. You never tell the crew that. They found that that improved safety because then the crew was making their decisions based on operational data, not on the specifics there. We bring in a new generation of helicopter pilots and we're having, unfortunately, to relearn that whole business again. So there's a key point, I think, for all of the operations and for those of us who are aggregating data to say, hey, how long is the memory lifespan of a particular incident and where do we bring that back into training to reintroduce it? And the nice part about this is we're not talking about big theoretical kinds of things, you know, and all kinds of government stuff. 
we're talking about flight operational things that pilots certainly should understand and be able to uh, take advantage of. And likewise, uh, on the maintenance side, um, can we talk briefly about maintenance? Are, are any of you doing anything on the maintenance side of things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, from a maintenance standpoint, if we have an aircraft that's uh, AOG, uh, an aircraft on the ground, aircraft on the road away from base, we, you know, we can instantly pull the data down and, and see what's going on and look at the engine trend data. And um, a lot of times we can you know, come up with a plan, an action plan for recovering the aircraft just based on the data. Uh, so that's, uh, that's very helpful and saving, saves a lot of time and money. FAA has still gotten off easy here. I'm not gonna let you off that easy. Um, what guidance do we have here, uh, Tom, uh, from the FAA on establishing an FDM? Well, uh, again, you know, we, we look at flight data monitoring systems as a tool to be used in other programs. We just call them different things. Uh, like FOQA, we have an AC for FOQA and an AC for uh, ASAP, the 120 series, uh, 12082 and 12033. I'm pretty sure that can kind of walk you through, but the, the idea for us is to have operators of these aircraft work, work with our local FAA people to tailor what they have to their operation to glean the information that they need to improve from, from our perspective safety. And usually when they're improving safety and analyzing that data, it improves the efficiency of their operations too. And we, we want them to work together with their local people. And then they in turn will, will bring in headquarters assistance to help get the programs established because they're all different. Every operation is slightly different. What kind of training, what kind of training does, uh... Uh, do the inspectors get because you know they're the ones that are right on the on the ground swell here and we heard in the previous panel that um, sometimes standardization is elusive that's well, as that, charitable as I can be there, there is a reason there's a, an s on the end of flight standards but we could get into that another time so what we've established is we we have headquarters subject matter experts you know in, in my section or my group that are 100% are available to those inspectors out there to help them maintain that level of standardization. I, again, with the variances that each operator, each certificate holder has. So, and we've been doing, you know, quarterly outreaches to all the regions and all the offices to try to make sure everybody's up to speed on, on who they can call, who they need to reach out to, to make sure that we're, we're doing things as effectively for the certificate holder as we can. So, so that's, that's tightening. And again, things, you know, the shift is more toward all these folks out here. They know their operations better than we do. And we would rather not, uh, you know, safety, you, you really can't force well, safety. Doesn't fit no, all. it does yeah. not. So let's talk a little bit about cost um, being the smallest operator here. Um, so my cost for oil analysis is about $20 per oil change. That's pretty reasonable. On my engine monitor, uh, I have a subscription. It's great that I'm collecting the data um, on a day-to-day -day basis and flight-to-flight -flight basis, but I'm, all that does is tell me I've got an immediate problem which I need to address. If it's not being analyzed, I'm not getting the major benefit of being able to be proactive. Uh, the subscription for that, where I upload it and, and get a report card back um, every couple of months, is about $130 a year. Well, even I can afford something like that. And as we go into some of the new areas which the associations are working on, um, well, let's, let's address costs just a little bit because that is one of the areas that people are concerned about. Uh, Morgan, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, so I think, I think cost is definitely a, uh, an area that, that can be an impediment. Uh, I think about in our operation, single airplane, we have FOCA flight data monitoring on the flight deck. We're also subscribed for engine data monitoring and so forth. And, and those costs are not insignificant. Uh, but uh, use an example on, on aircraft monitor, uh, maintenance monitoring, let's say on the engines. Uh, we talked to different operators where they'll one day receive a call from the engine manufacturer and say, hey, we've been watching your trend data and we're noticing a slow to close start valve. And maybe they've, they've had five or six trips where the valve's closing slower 
flight crew doesn't notice it. Uh, it's not something that we would track other than that the, the start valve did close prior to continuing with the next engine start. And then by them receiving that phone call, maintenance is able to proactively get ahead of that issue and address it before it becomes a problem when we're halfway around the world. And when we think about that cost benefit analysis of the cost of that program in comparison to what's the cost of us to recover a trip on the other side of the world, that gets incredibly expensive, sometimes incredibly difficult. So uh, I think that's how we think about that cost benefit of, of that, that cost. Jason? Yeah, I'd say, you know, when you first go out to, to start getting quotes on, on these different types of programs and everything else, it, it can be a bit daunting, you know, particularly as you, as you move up uh, well, you're, beyond you're a couple not, aircraft. You're not exactly a small operator, much right, as Right, but when we started looking at this, I mean, we were like at, at eight aircraft, you know, as we started to scale. But even then, as you start to get these quotes of, you know, I guess there's a, there's a spectrum of what you need, like, right. like you talked about. So I think, you know, not letting cost, think you need the, you know, the multi-thousand dollar analytics per tail solution might not be where you need to start in. So starting in at the, at the shallow end of the pool and kind of waiting up there and just start collecting, start with, you know, a few parameters. And even there, you can start learning more about your operation, uh, probably a lot more than, you, than you'd imagine, you know, just getting an initial spreadsheet and start looking at that, having somebody else do those, cost, those comparisons. You can start to learn about your organization and then realize, hey, what do I actually need? Maybe I don't need that $5,000 solution to begin with because I found a, a different way to analyze what, we, what affects our flight department. Please. Like operators to consider is that you don't have to outfit the entire fleet all at once. You can start with one or two airplanes if you've got 24 and you'll get benefit from that with a small initial outlay. You can test it, you can build your culture, you can do all those things and then as your fleet grows, your mission grows, your finances grow, you can add to that fleet as you go. Um, I worked for a 91 operator we had three airplanes, two of which had FOQA, one didn't. And as the safety manager, it was a great day when I started getting reports from my guys, hey Frank, we had this event happen on this airplane, just want you to be aware of it so when you see it in the data. And I said, well that's great, that airplane you were flying on didn't have the data. But they, but they got so used to having the system that they stopped thinking about it, and, but they stopped thinking that it was on the airplane, right? It wasn't a concern that it was there. But it was a, hey, we've got this other ability there. Rather than waiting for Frank to call me, I'm going to let him know that this event happened. Right? So even in that small three airplane fleet, we didn't have to out outfit everything to start getting benefit from having a focal program. Always better to lead and uh, right, go exactly. forward. OK. Yeah. Jens. Yeah, for the Asias program, I always like to use the term free because it's paid for by the taxpayer. That, that still is a cost, right? But for this cooperative effort between FA and industry that Doug, Doug introduced earlier, it is structured. So if you sign up as an operator, participation is free to you. Obviously, uh, the thing that's going to have to go into is your involvement with the program. You have to upload the data. Somebody has to be responsible for it. Uh, we'd like to have somebody actually look at the data and use it. And in many cases, a program like Frank's and others are ingested there and participation in those. Some of them are free, some of them are at a certain price tag. But the idea for those types of program is we want all the data in there. And it's tailored really to try to bring in all stakeholders as best suitable. And that's for the digital data. Um, when NTSB came out with the FDM recommendation, I know, you know the team working flight data recorders, I always start out on the digital side because I work for the manufacturers. If the goal is to monitor data, including contextual data, having an internal safety reporting system, maturing it into the more formal ASAP program with a third party entity or with your local FISDO, those are next steps. Taking the leap then over to the uh, digital programs, which comes with, in many cases, a, an upgrade to the aircraft. I think we'll pop some data up here later about most new aircraft have the flight data recorders. A QAR is available. Lately, the QR is one method to get the data off the aircraft. It's now also Wi-Fi enabled. So you can kind of look at the aggregate scale cost to, to what's suitable for you. But just if an operator shows up and says, for my operation, having an internal safety reporting system is step one, let's applaud what they're doing, right? And then so build the there. cost can be 
scaled. Let's move on to our next section, which is best practices. And uh, we're going to test technology here. Next slide, if we could. Uh, we're going to test the technology because we are going to remote in um, Andrew Walton with uh, Liberty University. So uh, if we can uh, get, uh, oh, there you are. Good morning, Andrew. How are you? Hey, good morning. Good. It's good to be well, here. We're, we're going to let him uh, uh, give you some background on uh, how Liberty is uh, doing uh, uh, flight data monitoring. So, Andrew, uh, it's all yours. All right. Thank you, Bruce. Um, so, Liberty is a private Christian university. We've got about 100,000 students, of whom about 4,000 uh, are studying aviation. Uh, in my role as director of safety, I oversee our flight data monitoring program. And that's provided some valuable insights into our organization. So I'm gonna start talking about kind of where we started, uh, where we are now and uh, where, we're, where we're moving. Um, so next slide, we started with uh, just collecting the data. Um, it was our uh, maintenance team actually that pushed for us to just, just start recording the data from the G1000s. And so um, as, things would happen, we would find this need for flight data analysis. Um, you know, in, in the picture up top, you can see a, an airplane off the side of the runway. That's not where our student pilots are supposed to be. Uh, in the bottom image, you can see uh, the flight data from that aircraft animated into Google Earth. And um, next slide. When we, when we analyzed what happened, we found that the student was doing a really good job with the crosswind technique, um, but essentially uh, had too much uh, pressure on the left brake pedal and ended up going off the side of the runway uh, as the instructor is rapidly yelling, my controls, my controls, my controls. Um, next slide. So the, you know, the ability to take an event that we know something happened, uh, analyze that using Excel or Google Earth or X-Plane and really understand the root cause. Uh, in this case, we just need to emphasize, you know, proper foot positioning on the rudder pedals prior to landing can be really, really valuable. Next slide. In 2016, we rolled out a formal flight data monitoring program uh, overseen by an FD FDM committee with a real strong just culture emphasis. And uh, the main tool we use is, is one of the tools that Jens was just talking about um, through the Asias program. And so that allows us to upload large batches of data. And with just a couple clicks, we can see, did anyone exceed v &E? Did they get too fast? Did uh, anyone fly upside down? Uh, did anyone over G the airplane? And um, just kind of seeing those parameters, being able to evaluate the trends over time, being able to look at the severity and see, okay, I had this many exceedances, but which ones were the worst? Which ones should I be focused on? Uh, has been really valuable. Next slide. Um, one of the emphasis items that we've been really focused on is loss of control in flight uh, because of the NTSB data that shows us uh, that that's a, that's a problem, um, particularly in flight training. And so the image on the top there is a tool uh, from the NGA FID that uh, uses a derived angle of attack algorithm to show in red where the aircraft stall horn would have likely been on. And so this is a simulated engine failure after liftoff um, where the student did not lower the nose and get to best glide and uh, got too slow uh, as he attempted to turn around uh, back to the field and, and activated the stall horn. Uh, the image on the bottom is a low airspeed on climb out event. And uh, again, Jens was talking about the, uh, the University Aviation Association uh, earlier this month. And this was a big topic there. Um, you know, in this example, and, and this is all just kind of sample data from that uh, NGA FID tool. Uh, but in this example, you see a, a crew practicing a short field takeoff. Uh, pitching the nose up above 20 degrees of pitch, uh, which is not necessary in a Cessna 172 with all 180 horsepower, uh, and it's not wise. And so in this case, the airspeed in blue gets all the way down to, I think, below 45 knots, 
uh, on the recovery and the altitude in orange ends up going back down. Um, you know, but they're, they're a hundred feet off the ground as they're having to correct for an excessive pitch to begin with in that maneuver. Uh, next slide. So that's, um, that's what we've been doing. You know, we pull that data every 28 days. Um, where we're moving to is cellular uploads uh, and digital debriefing. This has huge value uh, in flight training, uh, allowing the students and instructors to see their own data and get familiar with their own data and, um, and start to work with that. Um, so in conclusion, uh, flight data monitoring has provided some really valuable insights into our organization um, and certainly for other um, flight training organizations, for other universities. Um, it's helped us perform better root cause analysis and better insight into our accident precursors and track changes over time. Uh, kind of stay with us for a bit if you can. Uh, we're going to go through some other presentations and then uh, uh, we'll make sure to ask some questions. Uh, Morgan, I believe uh, it's your turn uh, to, to hold forth. Sounds great. Well, first I'd like to use just a little bit of my time here to just say thank you uh, to the NTSB and uh, NBAA for hosting this event around flight data monitoring. I think it's a, it's a topic that, that definitely deserves the attention, the advocacy, and I'm really glad to be here to be part of this, so thank you. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. So I've, I've had the incredible privilege over the last 10 years to work for two operators that really embodied flight data monitoring in our continuous improvement. And three years ago, I joined Adobe as one of our pilots and also as our safety manager. And it was kind of a unique situation. It was a brand new flight department. And I, I think that something that was really unique there was we got to build a flight department from the ground up. And so in those early conversations with leadership, we started talking about what do we want our safety program to look like? And everybody had a very strong appetite for continuous improvement and also had familiarity or previous experience using flight data monitoring in their safety program. So next slide, please. So as we kind of looked at it holistically, you know, we have a lot of data that does come into a safety management system. However, we talked earlier at the beginning about the definition of flight data monitoring, and I'd argue it's one of the most, if not the only objective piece of data or, or set of data that you have coming into your safety management system. But it's not the only data. And we really view the flight data in our flight data monitoring program as, as a piece of the puzzle. It might describe what happened, and, it, and it's great. We can look at second by second of something that might have happened on the flight deck. But then when we, when we paint the full picture with, with discussions from flight crews, we might go ask for air traffic control data, we might ask for other things, we really get a holistic picture of, of what happened, how it happened, why it happened. And then as we, as we put those things through our safety management system, we're, we're really able to come out the other side and try to dis define, do we need to change our policies? Do we need to update our training? Uh, are there standard operating procedures that we could adapt or develop? So as we came out of the gate, we, I think within about three months, we had flight data monitoring established and it was great. We started generating a lot of data. And uh, if we fast forward just a little bit, I think uh, if I were to say March, 2020, everybody would, uh, would know that the world shut down and so did flying for the most part. So for us, our flying went to effectively zero. So we decided we needed to figure out where do we get data to define where are the hazards that we may not know about. So we actually turned to the industry. And there was some mentioning earlier about benchmarking. And so there were still operators flying. And when we started looking at event rates across the industry, it just general event rates, we started to really see an increase in event rates as pilot proficiency started to decrease significantly. So that was something that we were able to take back through leadership and uh, apply resources for not only pilot currency, which is pretty straightforward. Every 90 days you go take the airplane out and each pilot gets three night landings and, and we've reset that. But for a pilot group that's used to flying three, 400 hours a year, the proficiency really starts to drop. So we were able to apply the resources to fly the airplane on more than just landing flights. We'd go out and do proficiency flying local in the, in the Northern California area. You go fly the airplane two hours, do a few landings, interact with the upper airspace system, air traffic control, 
Uh, we'd even go into, into FBOs and fuel. We'd find talking to FBOs. They said, oh, we haven't fueled the G650 in eight months. And you know, they're out there trying to fumble around, trying to figure out how to do it. And we were right there with them trying to, trying to you know, get proficient on it. So I think that was a, a really good success story where, where our data was lacking, but we were able to turn to the industry and say, hey, these are, these are challenges around pilot proficiency. And as we, as we watched our data through those proficiency flights and as we started to resume normal operations, we were able to see a, a general flat line in our event rate. And, and we really attribute that to leveraging our flight data monitoring program to, to, uh, from the industry perspective and, and pull that data and, and use, it, use it for our benefit. Uh, next slide, please. So here's another example that we used. So when we think about hazards and risks within aviation, we might look at our own data and maybe we don't generate any events. But we, we, we think it's really important to turn back to the industry and look at what are the risks and hazards that we're seeing across the industry. And uh, runway excursions have been a, a very high topic for, for quite a while now. So I think benchmarking is important. And if we look at the, the left graph here, we can see that our average touchdown point was about 1,300 feet down the runway and, and you know, roughly 10 to 15% better than the industry average. But we felt that we could do better on that. And I think this is an important part of where flight data monitoring can be used in a really positive way. And that's, that's coming up with, with higher standards that you think you can hold yourself to that, that would help you mitigate the risks associated with, let's say, runway excursions. We operate our airplane into shorter runways. So when we want to go look at operating in and out of a shorter runway, how do we objectively define that we've mitigated the risks around shorter runways? So we knew we could do better on this and we said, okay, we're gonna make some adjustments to our SOPs. We actually ended up adding a briefing item where we said, we're gonna, we're gonna our uh, arrival briefing, we brief our touchdown point. And our touchdown point for us is in line with the ACS standards, which is we're gonna land on the thousand foot markers every time, minus 250 feet plus 500. And then we also will brief a, a point of, of no later touchdown where we would initiate a go around. And in that simple shift, and then the, the conversation as a group, as we shifted into 2021, we can see that we, we pulled our average back, but that 97% of all of our landings were within that defined touchdown zone of, of the ACS. So now when we have that shorter runway discussion and we say, okay, we need to operate in, a, let's say 5,000 feet, 4,500 feet, leadership can have a level of confidence to say, the crews do the same thing every single time, regardless if they're landing on an 11,000 foot runway or if they're landing on a 5,000 foot runway. So I think this is a success story where the industry benchmarks are important, but also try to use it in a way that where you think you can improve and, and, and uh, mitigate the overall risk within, for this example, runway excursion. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, one moment. So I think we talk about flight data monitoring a lot of ways and there was the, the, the punitive discussion earlier about you know, how, that, how that can be viewed. And I really think flight data monitoring has the ability, if you can shift the discussion of, of what it really is. And we look at professional athletes. I think that they're one of, one of the best analogies that you can use in flight data monitoring. And you know, every time a, a player takes the field, they maybe go play that game for, for 90 minutes, 60 minutes, whatever, whatever the game is that they're playing. But then countless amount of time, significantly more time than they spend playing the game is actually spent reviewing their game footage. You know, they're looking at what, what went really well. Where were their opportunities for improvement? And it's, it's all in the interest of how do, they, how do they take the field better next time? And, and so I think by shifting that mentality around flight data monitoring as it's this really powerful tool for, for continuous improvement, I think we, we continue to change the story of what a successful flight data monitoring program looks like. So thanks everybody. That's kind of our overview of flight data monitoring at Adobe. So thank you. Thank you, Morgan. That, uh, that's a very good uh, uh, breakout. Um, next we'll go to uh, Jadet and uh, Jason, if you'd like to give us a little bit of your view on how all this works. So we talk about, you know, company now that we're up to, like I said, 24 aircraft, but, you know, take a step back when I, when I first started safety was just a year and a half ago and getting into the company as it was still growing from its infancy. Um, you know, we sat down early on and started road mapping where we want to take our SMS program 
and part of that roadmap included flight data monitoring. It wasn't going to be our first step because uh, we had a you know a lot of components to get in there, but really you know being deliberate. So if you're just going into now thinking about hey how can I integrate FDM into my own SMS you know as a um, as an integral part of that entire system, you know be deliberate about it and figure out where you want it to be and how it's going to be complementary to the, your other systems in there. So if you don't have ASAP and you don't have some of those other programs first. You know, I'd encourage you to start with that before you start getting into FDM or else you're, you know, you're just jumping into an area that really you're probably not going to be prepared for. Um, so as we started laying that out and we roadmapped this you know, with our CEO and everything else, they were fully complimentary of, of looking not where we're at now, but hey, where's our flight department going to be in, in five years? Because you know, we, we're starting to scale and building that program. Um, like some of the other impediments we, we looked at initially was I'm flying a new, relatively new plane of, of Honda jets. Um, we're the first fleet operator and the largest fleet operator out there, but no one had an off-the-shelf solution. You know, when I first started looking for it, I'm like, where do I find FDM for Honda jet? And you Google that, and it's nowhere to be found. Um, so some of that managing expectations of, well, I'm not going to find an off-the-shelf solution, so what can I start doing? And, you know, it starts with the basics of that, that bottom graph there of, I was able to start pulling uh, CSV, you know, just files of data off the planes with a simple SD card in, in the MFD off the Garmin 3000. So we started at least collecting that and, and knowing what we could do. Um, and then as we transitioned to knowing our, our fleet's all over, so it's difficult to get the data download, we found a, a solution with, with AirSync that's a, you know, very cost effective and enabled, you know, Bluetooth enabled to instantly upload the data to the cloud. So now I could have some that access to that data more, more quickly but also some, you know, some basic graphs of what's uh, provided there where you could start doing some comparisons of airspeed, altitude, and, and some basic analysis as you're moving forward. Next slide. Uh, we are lucky enough to have, as one of our pilots, uh, who did FOCA data for, for the Air Force on C-17s as well. So you know, we started bringing, <clears throat> bringing him involved early, um, not only to figure out how we could you know, generate the type of data we wanted to analyze, but also bringing his background in for, you know, all the rest of, of what you need to put in place for the processes of how you're going to do it, uh, how we're going to prepare our, our flight crew to be ready for um, this to happen, particularly if they've never had a taste of FDM before. Uh, I think there was a lot of apprehension about, hey, big brother watching me. Uh, so they were able to, you know, internally we were able to produce, do some of that analysis ourselves while we were still looking for you know, for solutions that would fit. And again, now as we're growing airplanes, the cost is rising to try and do this at, at scale. So like Frank mentioned initially, you know, we're like, all right, we're just going to pick a few tails at a time and just start moving out, right? We don't need to wait for that final solution. And that's where we started talking with the Air Charter Safety Foundation about looking for, it, we can't be the only ones trying to figure this out on our own. Uh, you know, so with, with Frank's leadership, we started, you know, that beta test group of bringing in uh, Cloud Ahoy as a partner to look at, hey, they have a really good individual debrief tool that a lot of people are familiar with. Can they aggregate that data? Uh, as I mentioned before, I, I can't watch 50 replays of a video in a day as, as a single person, so that's not really valuable to me. But if they can identify there's an exceedance, and now I can go know to go look for that flight, uh, that's where it's going to get valuable. And you'll see just some of those samples there uh, of what, what that's possible now. And so, like I said, moving forward, uh, you know, we're still, we're still looking for what our end solution is going to be to equip all the aircraft of what's the right, what's the right cost effectiveness, um, because it does get quite pricey when you start scaling into fleet. But we've already learned that we don't need, you know, the entire fleet equipped to be able to get actionable data. So seeing, you know, just on it, even with our first tail and first started getting data off there, we were able to start you know, challenging whether or not people were complying with their SOPs, just looking at air speeds and touchdown zones and things like that. Um, and now we really understand the data that's coming off the plane. So by only having it trickle in, it was much more digestible for, for me to understand, hey, what's, what's art of possible? You know, I might, I'm not getting flap information coming off the G3000, so, you know, that's not even a parameter that I'm going to be looking for for an exceedance. So, you know, really understanding the data at a slow rate, really helped us build in the infrastructure uh, to know what we wanted to look for, uh, what was possible to look for, and then preparing our, our pilots as well. We're not coming to them right off the bat saying, 
here's the 50 parameters you've been messing up. We told them, hey, we're gonna start looking at these dozen parameters on our flights, and we're gonna debrief to those. And then as we grow and scale and get higher levels of fidelity of data, you know, then we'll start looking at adding that on. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll next go to uh, Reed and uh, Tidal Aviation. Thank you. It's, uh, I just want to say it's an honor to be here and uh, presenting with, with uh, all of you and, and certainly the people in the audience have a vast array of experience. And so I appreciate the opportunity to do this. When we, uh, we first started Tidal Aviation almost 11 years ago, there was a, a, an accident uh, actually here in Florida that, that gained a lot of attention uh, within our industry. Um, it was a, involving a high-performance single-engine piston aircraft, and uh, it was actually a, a pilot that had rented the aircraft from an operator. And uh, um, the flight data actually uh, was, was discovered that uh, the pilot was conducting a low-level low aerobatic maneuvers, and, and he attempted unsuccessfully attempted a, a uh, um, aileron roll at low altitude, and, and it didn't didn't work out. But upon further investigation of the flight data and going back deeper into the, the aircraft's flight data recorder, we discovered it wasn't the first time that he had done this. Uh, it had happened several several occasions prior to that. Um, so it was kind of this accident was was really at the heart of when we were starting. It was it was on the forefront of my mind um, as we're renting these high performance single air engine aircraft. You know how are we going to uh, safeguard these million dollar assets? And uh, so that's really been at the the core of our philosophy since day one. Early on, we started with just you know basic fifteen dollar SD card in the in the uh, making sure that the avionics were recording the data. But manually uploading the data, you know, once every 28 days was was a little bit of an impediment, and so we went to the the air, you know, doing a, a, a basically a cellular uplink device that uh, um, receives the data via Bluetooth, and then after you shut the plane down, it, it automatically uploads all the data to a cloud-based program, um, and. It, we subscribe to a whole bunch of different services. So the, the, the cellular uplink device actually sends the data to our, our maintenance team's data analyzer. Um, we also send it to another program um, for debriefing, to use as a debriefing tool with, with all of our uh, flight instructors. Um, and then, of course, our FOQA program where, where it's uploading the data there to, to analyze the exceedances. Um, you know, when we first uploaded all the data, uh, we, we had about two years worth of data and we put it all in the program. We had uh, close to 4,600 flight operations. And uh, out of those 4,600 flight operations over two years, there was close to 400 exceedances, um, or roughly one every, you know, one every 10, 10 flights, which was, we thought was pretty good. But, uh, you know, as we're doing the program, we, we would get uh, roughly 20 exceedances for per week. Not necessarily critical, just, just things that, that were in the parameters we were looking at. And over the course of the, you know, the last few months that we've been doing this, as of last week, we were able to work that down to uh, having zero exceedances last week, uh, down from 20 a week. So we consider that a huge success in, in, in the program initially. Um, cost, we talked a little bit about cost already. The, the, um, that's one of the impediments that we ran into was you know, you look at the overall cost, and it was a lot more than, than what we were doing at the time. Um, and like somebody said, you could just test test one aircraft. We started out with one aircraft. We put in the cellular uplink device and, and started connecting it to, to various programs that we had subscribed to. And uh, it was such an overwhelming success to see how we took the program from what we were doing to now everything's automated. There's no excuses not to look at it. It's so much easier to look at it. Um, you know, if a, if a renter or an owner had an issue out doing their run-up, they could they could shut down and call our maintenance team immediately, and they could analyze what was going on right then and there on the spot. Um, huge time savings for us. Um, it, it, in a lot of ways, it saves on on having to do another flight test to 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 discover problems with the airplanes. Um, the, the bigger part of the program, though, is, is um, being able to come in and debrief. I think there's a slide coming up here. 
that uh, shows the, the smart board. We bought a 75 inch smart board uh, as a debriefing tool and uh, you know, trying to get flight instructors to, to, to buy into some of this has, has been part of the challenge. And I think this, this uh, smart board right here was probably the biggest key to the, the whole operation and getting everybody's buy-in. Um, when, they, when they complete the flight, they go back up to their debriefing room and the whole flight is right there instantly. They don't have to log in. Um, and the customers are really loving this too. So everybody gets their own account. Um, uh, one of the things that as it's uploaded, it, it looks at our scheduling software program and uh, captures the person's name and email and then loads it directly to their account. So it's very private in the way it's handled. Um, Nobody's looking at other people's flights. Um, the only people involved in it would be the flight instructor and the, and the pilot, or on the charter side or charter pilot. Um, and charter pilots, can you, can you can have everything isolated down to, to who's flying which airplane, and that helps a lot. But uh, our, our instructors are really excited about it. Um, they know that as they go to the airlines that they're, they're gonna have to, to um, partake in programs like this. and, uh, and and so being able to debrief with that and, and have a scoring system really works really well. Um, the cost, I think we talked a little bit about cost. Uh, uh, we're probably a little bit on the higher side for, for GA piston aircraft, but we spend about $200 a month per tail. And uh, I, I feel like that, that cost benefit analysis of that is, is uh, far outweighed in, in what we're able to do, not only you know, on the flight operations side, the maintenance side, but our accounting department can even use the, the programs for reconciling invoices. Um, so there's, you know, as you start to, to get a taste for using all the data, you start finding more ways to use it. Um, so I think I'll just leave it right there at that. And okay, well, I'll come back around and ask uh, uh, various and sundry questions, but since you just finished, um, has it made a difference in your insurance at all? You know, I'd, I'd sure like to think so. And, and we had an a in-depth conversation with the underwriters. I don't think the underwriters are necessarily looking at it right now for, at least in, in GA. Um, the conversation I had with my underwriter, he said, show me the data. And, and so we've been putting this together. And I, I do think that uh, um, it probably doesn't affect our rates right this minute. But over the coming years, as, as, as more and more people are buying into this, I think it, it absolutely will. And if nothing else, the, the improvement in safety and the reduction in accidents, I think, are, 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 might actually lead the, the uh, insurance industry in, in lowering our costs just because there's fewer accidents. Uh, um, I'll, I'll ask the same question yeah. of uh, all of the other operators. Uh, Andrew, I haven't forgotten about you. I know you're lurking in the ether out there somewhere. So uh, um, maybe we'll let you go first. Uh, any, any improvement in your insurance or anything of, of that nature? I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, excellent. No, I'll just say, I think this is a part of, you know, having a proactive safety program and so that's certainly something that we've talked with our insurance team about and something that they take into consideration. Um, you know, uh, like Title Aviation just said, I'd love to be able to put a number on it and say, well, we, we lowered our insurance rates by 5%, uh, but I, I don't know, um, you know, that, that, that's not a statement I can make, unfortunately. Well, the insurance uh, community also, like... Um the government tends to be reactive rather than proactive, and they always want to see the data. The good news out of all of this is, in the not too distant future, we're actually going to be able to show them the data and say, look at what we're doing. And um, I think actuarially, this is going to start to show up across the board. And then um, in my prior life in, in simulator training, it started off as, well, we're not so sure about this. and eventually evolved into it's the only way to go and it's it's now a condition of insurance in in most of the uh, most of the larger aircraft um, how about your maintenance costs uh, Andrew uh, any anything there uh, Reed mentioned it helps him with maintenance 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and particularly with the, you know, the newer cellular uploads, if you have an aircraft that's on the ground somewhere, the ability to, you know, uh, to look at that data without even having to, to, to leave the office um, is phenomenal from a troubleshooting perspective and, and helping figure out a, a way of getting that airplane back in the air. Um, but I, I think a, another example of how it affects maintenance costs is just having a good understanding, a good baseline understanding of where your organization is uh, just helps um, give a lot of wisdom to decision making. So, you know, quick, quick example story uh, that I love to share. We had, uh, we had a time where our maintenance team found some, some skin damage uh, on two of the tails of our aircraft. And after talking with the manufacturer, um, the manufacturer recommended replacing the entire vertical stabilizer on both of those aircraft. Um, and speculated, you know, this can happen if you, if you over G the airplane during a spin recovery. And we had been monitoring our data for quite a while. And, and we, um, kind of pushed back on that because we weren't seeing any spins. We weren't seeing any G exceedances. And so, um, because I think if we didn't have FDM as an organization, it would have been really easy to overreact to the, you know, the rogue pilot hypothesis. Uh, but because we knew our pilots weren't overging the airplane, we pushed back and, and kind of escalated with the manufacturer. And, um, and they, you know, because we knew that wasn't what was happening. Uh, they had their engineering team take another look at it. And they, um, they came back and said, well, actually, uh, the, the damage is still within limits. You're okay to keep flying. And so that saved us probably two months of downtime on each of those airplanes and tens of thousands of dollars um, in repairs, just because we knew that our pilots were flying in compliance uh, in that specific example. So the data will set you free, is what you're saying. Indeed. Okay. Um, Reed, um, how would you kind of start to sell the program in, in terms of this? Um, you're starting off slow and, and you've got management. Well, you are the management, I guess, but uh, uh, any thoughts on that? Um, you know, if, if I'm an operator that's looking at, at trying to get started um, and cost is impediment, I guess I would, I would go back to let's make sure that you've got an SD card and, and if the airplane is available to to uh, um, record the data, then at the at a very minimum, make sure you're collecting it, capturing it, and utilizing you know some of the SIS program or the, some of the other various free um, third-party programs to upload and analyze the data. Um, as as far as selling the program, I think the, the the biggest key to get everybody buying in is the the instant access. That's really where our program took off, and and. Uh, um, being able to kind of set everything up right in front of everybody where they don't have to go out and collect it from the airplane and, and uh, uh, upload. Ease, ease of use. And then the other thing which we started off with in, in terms of one of the key words in the definition was objective. Um, I know in my instruction, instructing career uh, back a long time ago, um, you debrief a student and say, well, you know, that didn't work out quite the way we thought it was going to, and the student says, what are you talking about? I nailed it. And the answer is, well, uh, let's go to the game tapes and take a look. And the exciting thing is, that as, as we're getting into this and introducing it to renters and, and instructors and, and even aircraft owners, the ones that are seeing it from day one, ab initio in their training, they don't know any different. And so as, as they're buying into this, um, we're seeing more and more uh, people get excited about scoring themselves. Um, you know, even if there's not an instructor or another pro pilot on board, they're looking at their last flight and comparing it to this flight and seeing if they improved. And so it, it, it dynamically challenges the, the, the pilots uh, without even having somebody pull them into a room and, and talk to them about the flight. Whole constant improvement thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bruce, if I may, I, I think Reed's really touching on a, on a term that I think is just 
critically important in all safety initiatives and its buy-in. So back to your original question around, you know, setting up a flight data monitoring program. I, I think the first thing that an operator needs to do is put up a mirror and ask the question, why do we want to do this? What's what's the true genesis of of making this investment? Is it is it continuous improvement or is it we're trying to chase down you know rogue pilots or, or so forth? If it's the latter, I think that's a, a cultural discussion that that needs needs some focus first prior to implementing an FDM program. But when you when you can start from the the continuous improvement side of things, you're definitely off on the right path. And then to drive the buy-in further, this might sound a little counterintuitive, but but I'd argue that that everybody that's a member of your organization, they need to have a show me moment. And what I mean by a show me moment is they need to be part of something that didn't go right. And they need to, they need to witness and experience firsthand how the team shows up in this event. And, and I think that that has profound impacts across the organization and, and for individuals as they go through these events because that firsthand experience is gonna drive their view of that safety program into perpetuity. So when they come in, if they, you know, their first three months on the job, maybe they go out and they have a, a pretty rough, unstabilized approach. You know, can, can first, can they become comfortable with sharing the story about the, the unstabilized approach? They get to witness how the safety program rallies around them. They get to witness how leadership rallies around them. You know, think about the think about the kicker. Back to the sports analogy. You know, it's halftime. They're going to kick a, a field goal to maybe put them up going into halftime, and the kicker misses the field goal. When that kicker's walking off the 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 field, does the team rally around him? Do they? You know, you see him come up, put the arm around him, say, "It's all right. We're going to get him next time." You know, that that support goes so far in that buy-in and driving people's excitement around using safety in such a positive way. So I think buy-in is just a, a critical concept that, that continues to need focus within organizations. And, and on that, I mean, we're talking FDM, but on the ASAP side, you know, one of the things when we bring on a new member that I'd love to see is the first ASAP report is submitted by the chief pilot or the DO, right? It's building that culture of, I'm going to share with you my my colleagues, my experience, you know, so, so when you have the chief pilot and DO flying that FOCO equipped airplane and briefing, this is what happened on my flight to their flight department, that really builds that sense of, hey, we're in this together. This isn't a witch hunt. You know, I'm showing you my dirty laundry, so to speak. Um, and it goes exactly to what, what we we're saying here is um, it just builds that culture of it isn't punitive. We're here trying to get better. And, and I'm gonna be the first one to step up and say, even though I'm the chief pilot here, I am not perfect. And this is what I learned from that event and this is what I wanna share with you, so. Yeah, yeah and so I've got a couple of questions for you regarding hardware, if you will. Um, what about lightweight recorders and programs? How are the OEMs kind of implementing those? I, I mean, I think you can see they're starting to be a groundswell of interest in all of this. And so, how? What's happening on the OEM side? Yeah, thank you. Uh, there should be a slide, so I'll start talking and hopefully you can pop up one that's very white with two pie charts on it and I'll get into the details. Uh, as the slide gets popped up, there's obviously different ways of capturing data, so I'll focus on the digital side of it. Uh, the traditional black box that you all hear about, uh, I'm on the engineering geek side. Uh, we call it either an ED112 box. That's what Chris and the team at the lab work with. That's your standard data recorder. Uh, there's a lighter version of it, the light data recorder called an ED-155. Same bells and whistles, uh, just more performance-based and more suitable for, for light GA. And really, when we wrote that standard 12, 14 years ago, the idea was to take it to uh, a price point that's more suitable for light GA. The, the ED-112, there, there's an extra zero on it compared to the 155 box. Both are hardened. I know that's very important to the team. They want to recover them. That's what you tend to see in the turbine community today uh, as the, the two prevalent ones here. Everybody has talked about that wonderful $15 SD card. Uh, this is the true innovation. If you have a modern cockpit, there is now an SD card capability. Um, from the accident perspective, um, we're seeing those survive to surprisingly high rate or the other embedded non-volatile memories. And if you have that SD card plugged into your G1000 or other avionics box, you can run a basic program. So let's start with the data here. Uh, when I got the invite, I'm like, let's, let's do something new and different. Let's do a survey here. Um, I talked to several companies that also have 
they're PISN OEMs. Uh, the SD card is kind of the, the standard there, but some of them have dedicated recorders in the t tail. Uh, Apario has a system, there are others out there. They're hardened, they may not meet the standard, but they're, they're doing the trick, right? The chart on the left that you're looking here is uh, current turbine business airplanes in production. Uh, what can you do? So that slight little sliver up there on the, in the gray is there's just not a data recorder. The rules didn't require it when the aircraft was designed. The design is 10, 15, 20 years old. And we do produce aircraft for that long. Uh, but as you see there, it's a sliver, single digit percentage of current turbine production fleet that just don't, it doesn't come with a recorder capability. And I won't, I promise everybody, I won't shame one manufacturer or another, but those are the kind of models that are sold that in the next couple of years, they're not even produced, which means over the next few years, if you're buying a turbine airplane, it's gonna have a recording capability. The big orange graph there, that's the standard box ED-112, ED-155 box. And as you see there, quick math here, it's in the 70, 80% range here. And then the other part, the SD card, the embedded recorder, a non-standard box just in the aircraft. So we're really high with recording data on turbine airplanes. On the right side, let's look at the FDM capability. Uh, try to pick good colors here, but they're very inconsistent. So let me just walk you through it if you can't really read it. The gray there is, I can describe that as no access to FDR. And, and one of the companies sent me an email was like, well, you can go over to the aircraft with a laptop specifically configured, plug yourself in and download the data. Probably not what you would be doing on a regular basis here. So that's about a third of the fleet where we're still in that situation that there's, there's no easy way to get the data off the aircraft unless you either get an STC, a service bulletin or something like that. But the rest of the data here, I won't step to, through the details here, but the other two thirds, uh, 70, 80% there that you see up there on the graph, there's either just standard QAR, the quick access recorder, or the Wi-Fi enabled that just provides a nimble, nimble program. Either standard from the OEM, service bulletin from the OEM, you gotta opt into it usually, or there's an optional thing from the OEM. This does not get into the aftermarket, but if you're buying an aircraft today, these are the capabilities that are out there. So first of all, NTSB's long story about we need data records on the aircraft. Uh, I would say on the left side of the graph, we've gotten pretty darn close to it for the fleet here. Again, it stopped at the turbine side, but on the piston side, there's also the side here. Over the past decade, the conversation about participating in that safety program, um, I talk to my members, but the most important voice that they can hear is from their customers. Hey, I wanna buy a new airplane for specking that as part of that, I wanna have an ability to get the data off the aircraft because I wanna to, want to participate in a program. When ROEMs hear it, they build it into the next rev here. And as you see there, we're at the, not only the majority, but converging on most of the fleet there that have at least an option and lately even just standard to get it either as a QA or, or a Wi-Fi enabled off the aircraft. Be right with you, sir. Two thoughts come to mind. One is, you know, at NTSB, we shoot for perfection. We want absolutely, no matter what happens to the airplane, we want to be able to get the data. However, uh, I'm a firm believer in that the, um, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And what you talked about is having a reasonably hardened box in the back of the airplane uh, will get us to probably the 80, 85% recovery rate. And even with the SD cards, uh, we see uh, amazingly uh, a high degree of recovery, even with those where they're not hardened. So as I said, the worst reason for doing this is to make our job easier. The main reason for doing it is what you've, you've, you've already heard. Um, sir, let me take your question. You're being very patient, go ahead. No, please. Uh, one of them is to plug NBAA in their safety manager certificate course. If you have not yet seen that, it's new. Take a look at it. It's on their website. It is very well done. I would even take it a step farther than the manager, and I would have everyone on my safety team complete. Uh, they do very good uh, at emphasizing safety culture. Um, the other thing for is bail operators, uh, part of the new progressive stage three is access to a database where the identified SMS data, data can be put into the database 
And over time, the goal is to build a database large enough so that these bail operators can do a trend analysis using that database. It's, the program is new for its bail operators. It's something you might want to look into. Um, last thing, and I just want to emphasize um, what you said about safety culture, because I saw it work when the chief pilot stands up, says to the group and says, I just completed an SMS report. Let me tell you about my approach into Westchester and what I could have done differently. It opened it wide. If there was any problem, any issue at all on anybody weaponized reporting, it just went away. So I, I, I've seen it happen and it was just outstanding. Excellent. Thank and I'm you. sorry if I interrupted. No, no, no. That's, that's, that's fine. It, it is to remain to the topic. Getting back to the OEMs, um, you know, decades ago, uh, the industry uh, started to have difficulty with product liability. And to my view of thinking, and I think perhaps maybe to the community, I don't know, having the ability to monitor what actually happens, because as we know, most of the time, look in the mirror, it's us, the, the pilots or the maintenance technicians that have created the problem. It's generally not the product. Every once in a while it is. That's a two-edged sword, but it cuts one way about 90% of the time and it cuts the other way about 10% of the time. So if you're, if you're keeping score on numbers, it generally solves significantly what your liability issues are gonna be, which is going to lower the cost for all of us across the board and as opposed to uh, some of these other things. Um, do we have any idea roughly how many people are participating in this? I know this was asked in the, in the previous session. Uh, certainly on the 135s, it's, it's kind of a low uptake. Uh, not necessarily, partly because of the operators having some reticence and partly because there's a perception that this is really complicated. And thirdly, Tom, sorry to throw a rock in your corner, but the FAA doesn't have the ability to process. But Jens? I, I, I would love to come up with a number, but there's so many programs and that's probably, a, that, that's a good thing, but there's so many programs that I couldn't get into. You know how many you have, Claude Ahoy has a certain number, Seafolk has a third one. The Asias one, which is a subset overlapping there, there's a public list of 150, 160 plus universities. We've looked at the data, it needs to be more. Uh, if, if I look at our colleagues over on the airline side, for example, in a program like Asias, it is high 90% that you participate in the Folkway and or ASAP program. That is something we should be striving toward. Uh, how do we make our way through our entire industry? Uh, I don't think we can practically get everybody involved immediately. Uh, on the formal programs involving the government. We just don't have the resources that will happen over time. But, you know, let's start with the 135s. If you're holding yourselves out there to, to, to the flying public, you're, you have that additional uh, participation rate. We actually have surprisingly large participation in the program that I'm involved with from the 135 community, which is a good data point that they're realizing that looking at their data is key to that additional responsibility for flying somebody who is not an aviation person and the additional level of care there. So we're not at the 121 level, unfortunately. So we need to get that community to, to start participating in different programs. I work with Asias because I live in DC, which is where we work with the federal government. It's one option, but there are so many options that I hope operators, you know, as part of a show here like MBA goes out and look at what program lends itself to me. What fleet do I fly? Where do I fly? is at that ASAP program, so we can continue to pursue toward that convergent point of our, our airline colleagues. Bruce, I, I'd offer Please. that uh, the, the end state of flight data monitoring is a state in which we're comfortable sharing the data. So programs like ASIAS that are the consumers of flight data, pilot reports, that kind of thing, is where we want people to get to. But as I've seen, lacking a mandate, which is going to be solved here in a little bit, that's a journey. People have got to get comfortable culturally with the fact somebody's looking at their performance. They have to get comfortable with the fact that we're now going to hold each other accountable to our performance and use that as an opportunity to improve. We've got to get comfortable knowing that I'm going to be, uh, my, my data is going to be used to improve the operation as a whole 
And only at that point, I think, is the operator then going to be comfortable getting to a point where they're wanting to share that data. I have a feeling the number of operators that are participating in some sort of flight data monitoring program is a lot higher than the numbers that we have sharing the data. We just don't know about it. Exactly, and yeah. so as we, as, we're, as we complete this journey, we're, we're going to see higher numbers of operators get comfort with the program, find value in sharing, and then start reaping benefits from what that sharing is going to lead to. Frank, uh, anything to add in that area? No, I think Doug's pretty much hit on it. I mean, I, I guess the one thing I would add to that is that we're sharing the data today whether we realize it or not. So um, a couple of really brief examples. Um, we manage a lot of ASAP programs. I spend a lot of time on YouTube. So um, one of my operators had their flight show up on YouTube because somebody had the ADSB data, had the live ATC data, and there it was with the flight number, tail number, this uh, course deviation in that case. Um, the data is out there. So we can, we can choose to sit back and let the YouTubers of the world analyze our data for us and go to the court of public opinion and tell us what we could have done differently. Or we can be proactive, we can take our own data in, we can analyze it ourselves, and we can strive to be more professional, more precise. In, in the part 121 area, I mean, you look at the safety record of the air carriers. Now, I'm always fond of saying that general aviation, corporate aviation, and the airlines are pretty close to one another in terms of the type of operation. But light general aviation is not the airlines, it's not corporate aviation, and so we have to change the expectations because the equipment is different, the pilots are different, the environment is different, the objectives are different. But still, there is something tremendous to be gained by emulating at the appropriate level what we can accomplish. So as we kind of get into the wrap up here, we've defined uh, flight data management. And I hope everybody in the room can remember this. It's an objective analysis of aircraft and engine performance to give us actionable data in order to make continuous improvement. Uh, we've talked a little bit about best practices. We've uh, hopefully eliminated some of the objections and um, we've talked a little about implementation. So as we, I'm just gonna go around the room here and, and ask you know, what, what your takeaway is. So uh, Tom, we'll uh, start off with you. Um, any well, it, it's, it's great hearing what everybody's doing. I'm real familiar with the SIAS and, and the other programs. And, and I, I, there was a, a, a remark made a moment ago about you know, uh, mandating, I think it was. And you know, we, can't, we can mandate safety all we want, but the end users are the ones that make things safe. And from the FAA's perspective, you know, we're, we're really welcome to the industry stepping up and managing their, their safety programs. And whether or not we, we actually get it approved, you know, like the FOQA has to be an approved program, that doesn't mean you can't have one. It's just like SMS. It's only required for 121, but it doesn't mean you can't have one. So thank you for that. I appreciate yeah, the participation. I think, I think we can probably say, you know, if the industry and the culture of the industry is saying this is expected, regardless of whether it's mandated or not, that's, uh, that's the, uh, the right thing. Uh, I'll come back to you so you can kind of get situated here. Morgan? <laughs> Probably one of the biggest things that I've learned over today and in the past couple of days, I'd actually say that I've never been more excited about where we're at with this. And I, I think we've got our foot on the gas on the right areas, but something that I didn't necessarily realize, I've, I've had a pretty narrow focus over the past 10 to 15 years, and that's been larger turbine category aircraft. And we've been solving those problems within that, that ecosystem. But hearing from Andrew about what's going on in, in primary flight training at Liberty. The previous session, there was the discussions around Embry-Riddle and their, their FOCA programs, their ASAP programs. I think that that's energizing another generation. And as these young professionals leave the training environment and start coming into professional flight organizations, they're gonna have the opportunity to influence. 
and, and become leaders in their own organizations. And, and I think that's where we'll see the most impactful change as we see that, that next generation of aviators coming into organizations and, and, and they've been used to it by this point. So, I mean, I, I can only think about, it. I went through Embry-Riddle back in 2000 through 2004 and we were flying old 180, 172s and it was fantastic. But that idea of by the time you shut down and walk into the, the debriefing room, you've got it up on a 75 inch screen, that turn around a point or that short field landing, it's just second nature that that's what we do. And so by the time you advance further and further in your aviation career, it's just what you expect. And, and if you find an organization that doesn't have it, either A, it's that, it's that maybe pause where you say, maybe that's not somewhere I wanna go, or it's an opportunity for that individual to go in and start influencing it. So uh, I'm excited. Reed? Um. Well, <clears throat> one of the things, like, like Morgan said, it's, uh, it's energizing to see everybody involved in this and what they're doing and what everybody else is doing. Um, I definitely think that uh, I didn't realize how many other programs are available. You know, SIAS uh, wasn't aware of that. And so in learning about some of these other programs is, is uh, interesting to me to see that there's other tools available to us that we could be using and utilizing. Uh, certainly, I, I think that uh, it's exciting to see where this, this flight data man, mon, um, management is going. I, I really do believe that it's gonna be a um, one of the next big things, you know, maybe as big as uh, primary flight displays or, or uh, synthetic vision, you know. It's moving us to a much yeah, better synth synthetic place. Synthetic vision has moved, you know, we, we haven't seen any seat accidents in planes equipped with synthetic vision. And this could be, uh, this could be really something that's equally as big or bigger. Great, thank you. Jason. I think one of the big things, my takeaways is, uh, I guess changing perspective on you know, the scalability, not only, we've talked about SMS, but scalability of flight data monitoring. You know, if, if your notion of flight data monitoring is the program that's at United with full playback capability and everything else, you know, that that's, seems like, man, I'm never gonna get there. Why would I even start that, that journey? But listening to, you know, just how we've kind of all muddled through and, and found our own roadmaps of getting to a place or, you know, what you're doing is flight data monitoring on, on your single plane, right? The smallest operator, yeah. Right. Done. So, you know, every journey begins with a step. So, you know, I think I've just learned, you know, maybe that's my ideal is where the trajectory I want to get to, but, you know, you, you just have to start somewhere uh, and start that analysis. And, you know, everyone that's now has a really, you know, boutique type program probably started initially with just a couple lines of data and, and trying to figure that out. So, Jens? Several years has been, and, and I've been part of these discussions, early 2000s, this was big and scary and cultural challenges, and, and those are the harder ones. I think we're, they're, they're mostly behind us, the technology is behind us. It's not six-figure number investment to get it on the airplane anymore. It's a, it's a different figure for most operators. So FDM, to me, becomes that baseline safety for most operations, especially if you're involved with the more advanced part of the aviation or, or holding yourself out. To me, that is now baseline safety and it should be an expectation of what would say so the public that you're doing this kind of activity uh, but uh, probably your owners your operators and individual pilots one thing that i've been noodling you you, you reinforce the definition of fdm and in, in, uh, when we met yesterday and you've mentioned it several today, times that that objective data so that's to me objective means digital data uh, that's where ntsb is driving on the most one list that's important. I still like that subjective contextual stuff that I get from an AS or S or ASAP reports. And when I, when I, yeah, when I read the, the original recommendations when it came out and that material, I, I think you guys were saying FOCA FDM. I like it was FDM because it's a slightly broader term. But let's not forget those other programs that can get a lot of folks into sharing the data. And when we're looking at individual incidents, sitting down with the FAA and TSPs often at the table, uh, that pilot report, it tells a story beyond the ones and the zeros, which is also very important. So I think it's the, let's get everybody to an FDM. It, it helps you with your operation. These days it's low cost, but let's also remember that simple safety reporting, it, it can teach us a lot of things. And I think it can help with the culture with the reports. They had something happen. Nothing is better than sitting down and, hey, write down, this is, this is how I messed up and what I can do next. So the full story around those two, I think is important. Frank described it, and, and so did Morgan, about, you know, there I was. And as pilots, we like to tell stories, and sometimes, and sometimes, occasionally, they're self-deprecating. Not often, but once in a while. And, 
of course, of course. But the fact is, if you start off with hard digital data, and then you have a story to say, okay, that's what the, the dots show, but let me tell you what was going on inside the cockpit and, and how we as human beings are reacting to these kinds of things. Frank? I think for me, the takeaway today is just, uh, I look at who's on the stage. Is everybody from the regulator to operators to associations to the OEMs, and we're all marching in the same direction. Um, and I think that's amazing, you know, and even more powerful to me is I've been in the focal world uh, for 15 years now. The number of people sitting in the audience in front of us on a Thursday afternoon after a convention is remarkable. And I, and I mean that in all sincerity that the, the number of folks that are interested in this is growing and growing and growing. And I think we are just at a, we're reaching a critical mass where this is just going to break out. It is going to become the regular part of doing business. And I think that is a remar remarkable place to be and I'm thrilled to be on the stage with this group of people who are gonna help us get there. So, and thank you to the, the board uh, and NBAA for, for helping us host this. This is, it's just, a, it's a great, exciting time to be here. Mr. Carr. I'll try to keep it short and simple. I think the, uh, the, the, We've achieved something today with this panel in that I, it's, it's reinforcing that there's a solution for everyone. Big and small, complex and non-complex, from training all the way up through regular frequent operations. There's a solution for everyone out there. Uh, if you do a search of your NBA app, little plug here, for data, you'll find about four dozen companies out there that are offering something related to data. Uh, go find them. See, see if one of them has a solution for you. And if not, just use the device that you did the search on because there's probably a solution you can put on here that will get you started down that track. Um, this is the norm going forward. This is going to be expected. And I think for those of us that haven't yet found that solution, I would, I would encourage you to, to seek out your peers, find those, find those companies, those solutions that will work for you. Because as, as was mentioned earlier, new people coming in, new ways of thinking are going to expect this at some point. And we have a real opportunity to make that transition from analog to digital a, a real asset for us going forward. Okay, so before we leave this, uh, um, Andrew, if you're still out there in the ether, uh, we'd like to get your takeaway from all of this. And uh, we're most appreciative of your uh, kind of hanging on here. No, thank you. Um, you know, I, I agree with everything that was just said. Um, and I think everything that was just said was, was very much focused on um, the momentum and just, just the positive energy that I think as a panel we're feeling right now. Um, my thoughts go back to where we started, uh, which, which we, we started this two hour presentation with, with three case studies um, of wrecked airplanes. And I think my thoughts as we close are that the true value of flight data monitoring is allowing us to see accident precursors before we have to grieve the loss of another pilot. Um, you know, I, I talked in our data about, you know, seeing low airspeed on climb out um, as, as one exceedance or one precursor that the SIS program allows us to look at. Um, in the university cohort, that rate, kind of the average rate for all of us is close to 10% of the time where somebody's 10 knots below VX at 100 feet or more off the ground during climb out. And so when we have, you know, when we have those precursors in the data, and then, you know, it, as an industry, as a flight training industry, we lose a couple airplanes every year to a fatal stall on climb out. Um, it just really, um, it, it really emphasizes how much, um, how much more work there is to do um, and how much we as an industry need to continue to strive towards safety. So, so FDM is a powerful tool 
And, um, and it's certainly one that is exciting and is dynamic. Uh, but the ultimate purpose, I, I think, really is, is to reduce the number of accidents that you, the NTSB, are, are having to come out and investigate. Thank you. Uh, I've been working to put myself out of this business for uh, decades. But uh, let me leave you with a couple of thoughts. Um, you know, in the, in the operators that we looked at, as I said, they had years of safe operation, but they failed to take advantage of the information that was there in front of them uh, to, to prevent uh, the crashes. Um, professionals, the difference between a professional and uh, an amateur, the professionals will go back in and they will analyze what they've done. So we've talked about football and game tapes. You look at musicians, they go back and they practice to see if they can get a little bit better. I would even say some of the uh, lower order activities such as golf, you know, people are checking their swing and looking at how all of that works. Amateurs don't do that. They get to a certain level, they plateau and they stop. That's not how things should be, even in, in good companies. The management should be looking back at the last quarter and saying, okay, did we hit our marks? How did we do it? What did we do right? What did we do wrong? What can we do better? It's a constant improvement. And the most important flight is not the ones that you've flown for the last 10 years. It's the next one that is the most critical. So with that, I'd like to thank our panelists here for uh, putting up with me for uh, uh, two hours. Um, I would like to especially thank the NBAA for giving us a, a, a forum for uh, all of this. I would also like to thank our NTSB staff who has uh, been uh, working very hard to record uh, this for posterity. And most of all, I'd like to thank all of you for taking time to come and join us. Safe travels, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>